Blog Talk Radio. Laurie Smith, one child to be survivor to another restoration. Glad to be here. I missed my show last week, actually for the last couple of weeks. And uh, sorry about that for everybody who tuned in. I had a bad, bad cold and forgot to, to uh, forgot to cancel the show. And then uh, another day I was just exhausted and I forgot to cancel the show, so I'm really sorry. And uh, <laughs> I usually try to cancel the shows ahead of time. That way people don't show up and then nobody's here. But um, I do appreciate everybody who's taking the time to listen. Um, we're looking at a topic right now um, dealing with uh, personal boundaries and boundary issues. And that's what we're covering from Havoka.org. So, yeah, I'm just a survivor. You know, I'm not a counselor or therapist or anything like that. I've just been doing blog talk radio since 2009. It's 2018, November 26th, Monday night here, 10 o'clock in the evening, Alberta, Canada. And, uh, you know, I'm just doing these shows as one survivor to another, really, um, just to try to share resources and sort of, you know, be a uh, sort of a source of encouragement for other survivors out here who may not have anybody to talk to and just don't know how you're going to cope and, you know, that they're, you know, just, uh, there is help out there. You have to look for it. You know, you have to reach out and get help. I know I, 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 I started to reach out in basically 2009. I basically, I started my healing journey in 2007, but I didn't do a whole lot of work in it until 2009 that's when I started to really reach out to people, you know, to, to look for resources, right? And there are there are resources out there, and uh, but you do have to, to look for them, right? Um, I'm the Alberta Ambassador for NASCA, N-A-A-S-C-A. That's National Association of Adult Survivors of Child Abuse. And you can go to the website there and get all kinds of resources and info, and you can talk to people. Um, you know, there's there's other ambassadors in all, all over the place, all over the United States, all over Canada, other parts of the world. And, you know, these people can hopefully help you get some resources if you need them, right? If you're a survivor and you're looking for some information, just go to NASCA, dot org, and, and uh, take a look there and see if something there might help you, might be of use to you. And uh, if not, get a hold of me or get a hold of one of one of the ambassadors there at NASCA, and uh, we'll try to find it for you. So if you're a survivor and you're listening tonight, make sure you're in a safe place, you know, you want to be safe enough to be listening. I usually say this on all my shows because you want to do a safety check. You don't want to hurt yourself or hurt somebody else being triggered by information that might cause you to go backward in your healing journey or something in that you don't want. And so make sure you're in that safe place, right? If not, just turn the show off. And anybody else listening, you have to listen at your own discretion. You know, I'm talking about child abuse and adult survivor issues, and these are very serious issues. So it's not a very comfortable topic for most people. And, uh, you know, you just need to make sure that you're okay with it. Otherwise, I mean, you know, just turn the show off. You won't be hurting my feelings at all. I do have the chat room open there if anybody wants to sit in there. With a link to Havoka, we're looking at uh, personal boundaries. This is one of the last sort of um, topics, I guess, I, that from Havoka that, we've, that we're going to cover. We've pretty well checked everything out there. They have a, It's a great website. That's a H-A-V-O-C-A, Help for Adult Victims of Child Abuse, dot org. H-A-V-O-C-A dot org. 
and uh, you can go to their survivor info and hit the tabs and scroll through there and see what they have. They have all kinds of info there for people, so take a, take a look. It's really good info. So we'll just pick up where we left off. I'm not going to go back and repeat too much of what we were talking about the last show a few weeks ago. This is just the beginning part of their um, looking at personal boundaries. So they said boundaries define limits, mark off dividing lines. Um, the purpose of a boundary is to make clear separations between, you know, between what we're going to allow in our life and what we're not, right? They're ba- they basically help people to protect themselves, you know, in healthy ways, learning how how to have he- what, what healthy boundaries are, how to set them, how to defend them. Um, so we talked about that last time, took a look at that. So we'll just pick up right where we left off. So they said here, this is from Havoka.org, and I'm just reading right from their website. We need to start becoming aware of what healthy boundary, healthy behavior and acceptable interaction dynamics look like before we can start practicing them ourselves and demanding the proper treatment from others. We need to start learning how to be emotionally honest with ourselves, how to start owning our feelings, and how to communicate in a direct and honest manner. Setting personal boundaries is vital is, is a vital part of healthy relationships, which are not possible without communication. And they say here, the first thing we that we need to learn to do is communicate without blaming. And that means stop saying things like, quote-unquote, you make me angry, or you hurt me, or you make me crazy, or how could you do that to me after all I've done for you, etc. These are the very types of messages we got in childhood that was so has so warped our perspective of our own emotional process, on our own emotional process. So the person that wrote this article said, I grew up believing that I had the power to make my father angry and to break my mother's heart. I thought that I was supposed to be perfect, and that if I was not, I was causing the people I loved great pain. I grew up believing that something was wrong with me because I was human. I grew up believing that I had power over other people's feelings, and they had, they had, and they had power over mine. And there's a lot in these articles. You know, we could spend weeks really talking about these, uh, just a little blurb like that. There's so much in it, but um, you know, we won't take the time to do that. We're just basically taking a look at it and talking a little bit about it. But you know, there's all kinds of good information out there about boundaries. I found that. Um, Oh, years ago I started. I looked at John Bradshaw's work, and I have a couple of his books, and and, and one of them's like a workbook, and dealing with um, uh, codependency, and that has a lot of information in there about boundary work. It's really really helpful. Uh, John Bradshaw, as well as uh, Robert Burney, he does, he he has great info. Um, you can go to his website, Joy to You and Me, or just type in Robert Burney B U R N E Y, and he has a great book. Uh, the Dance of Wounded Souls. That's also about codependency, codependency, but also talking a lot about boundaries. And so I did take a look at all all that years ago, which was very helpful for me. I needed to learn boundary work because I had no no healthy boundary uh, stuff at all. <laughs> I had to go and like learn it from scratch. And I'm still working on it because I still don't have it down, you know. But I do know that I'm not going to let anybody abuse me. So. You know, I'm going to treat people with dignity and respect and and care and concern just the same as I would expect from somebody else to treat me with the same uh, treatment. So that's all I'm expecting, you know. Um, but that's 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 good because I don't want to be revictimized. I'm just, you know, I've had enough. And so in my adult years, you know, I'm not allowing anybody to abuse me anymore. But I still have uh, issues with some boundary stuff I tend and and we'll look at more of this article you can go check this out yourself it's really quite good um as as we progress through here maybe we won't get to it tonight but maybe next show like make next monday night or you can go check this out yourself it's really good info and um but yeah we could spend i mean weeks just on this one part we need to start becoming aware of what healthy behavior and acceptable interaction dynamics look like before we can start practicing them ourselves. And that's just true. I mean, if a person's grown up in a dysfunctional, abusive environment, um, you know, not being shown as a child or as a youth what proper, like, healthy boundaries, healthy behavior is, healthy boundaries, healthy behaviors, acceptable interactions, you know, how's, how is a young person being molded and shaped um, with all of those dysfunctional behaviors and dysfunctional ways of dealing with things and, and how, how are they supposed to know proper boundaries? You, you, you don't learn that stuff. And that's why I had a, I've had a, a hard time <laughs> my whole life really dealing with this stuff. And it's some of it's 
you know, not that big of a deal, but some of it was cost me jobs, many times jobs and, uh, you know, just quitting jobs over stuff that really was boundary issues that I had no idea how to handle. I'm getting a lot better at it as I get older and I, you know, basically treat people with respect and dignity. Just, you know, proper human dignity that I that I would want afforded back to me. And then if, if, if that doesn't happen, then there's a problem. Because I'm like, look, I'm going to treat you right, so I expect to be treated right back. And then I'm I'm getting better at at uh, confrontation. But I used to be horrible at it. And so I'm learning, but it's just such a slow process. But it's it's how, you know, how do we even know what these behaviors are if you've never been, sh- if you've never been shown? Um, I had to do a lot of work to look at, wow, where I came from, the mess that I grew up in, what it did to warp my every, my my very existence on the planet, and then try to figure out, okay, well, you know, how am I going to do this? I had to do a quick fix when I was in my early 20s just because I wanted to be able to keep a job <laughs> so that I could survive and not end up on the street because there was no way anybody was going to be looking after me. So I had to make sure that, you know, I could work, maintain, pay my bills, and, you know, sort of make it through, you know, just getting started in my adult years because I had no idea how to do it. I had done drugs from the age of 12 until 22, basically 21, 22. 22 is basically when I got off the drugs. But, um, you know, I just had, didn't have a clue. So um, I had to really work hard to for the first early part of my 20s just to try to fit in with people that were my age group um, to get these, to, to, to find work, right, and to be able to keep a job. And so I, I, I managed, but still had all kinds of problems dealing with boundary issues. So it's taken me a long, long time to deal with this stuff. I really wish that I would have started this stuff a long time ago. Like, that's, I've said this many times on these shows since 2009 here, <laughs> the last nine years. I've said that many times, I'm sure. You know, I wish I would have started earlier and started younger, um, getting help, right? Instead of waiting till the age of 42 to finally reach out. But I was just so messed up. That's the problem with abuse, you know. Um, it's, a, it's a harsh situation. And most people, I've done some reading and just, you know, it, it, just looking around on the Internet. So many people don't actually reach out until they're about in their 30s. That's when they sort of have like a, a breakdown and have to reach out for some help, 30s, 40s, you know, it can happen, right? It happened to me at the age of 41, 42. So it's a, it's a harsh situation, right? Then you have to try to, you know, spend the next so many years working through this stuff. It's very, very difficult. So they said, uh, I guess what we could look at here is um, first thing we need to learn to do is communicate without blaming. That means stop saying things like, you make me so angry or, quote, unquote, you know, you hurt me or you make me crazy or any number of things like that. They're the types of messages that we got in childhood that warped our, our warped us. So we need to, we need to change that. Um, and also, this person who wrote this article says they grew up believing they had the power to actually make their father angry or to break their mother's heart, and just by their just by their actions or whatever. I suppose I thought that I was supposed to be perfect, and that if I was not, I was causing the people I loved great pain. I grew up believing that something was wrong with me because I was human. Yeah, I can relate to that. The, the, what, the first part of what she's talking about, I think it's a woman who wrote this article. I, I don't know. They didn't put a name on it. But anyway, what they're saying there is you know, that they had the power to make their father angry or to break their mother's heart. I don't really relate to that. I mean, my parents were just angry all the time anyway. It didn't matter what we were doing. We We, we could have been behaving ourselves or not. And been abused so that's the problem with abuse right it's not necessarily because you know a a child is doing something wrong um it's just a it's a it's a way to control and it's a way to manipulate and so uh you know to to overpower and to make sure you get your needs met so that's what my parents were both all about is meeting their own needs and they didn't care about the needs of their children and they they were highly abusive people but um I do relate to what this person says here as far as I grew up believing that something was wrong with me because I was human. Because that's something that I think most survivors of abuse have had to deal with. is the fact that growing up abused so many times, children actually probably, I would say, the majority of the time, even you know, no matter how long the abuse went on, it doesn't matter if it's six months, you know, a year, two years, or their whole life, which is my case, um, 
we're not probably allowed to show any kind of true human um, responses to the abuse, right? So therefore, there's just some, you know, it warps and twists you, you know. Um, something was wrong with me because I was human. Um, I think abused children, growing up abused, automatically take that on anyway that there's something wrong with them. Because why would there, why would these people be a, whoever it is, whether it's a parent or a caregiver of some type, why would they be doing that? Why would they be hurting them if, you know, if there wasn't something wrong with them? And also not allowed to feel emotions or to feel anything. I know we were not allowed to sh- to show any emotion towards what was going on in the house because it was such a nightmare. Like my parents were fighting all the time, a lot of domestic violence, and that would cause a problem with, the, of course, the, the children would freak out. So I came from a big family, so I'm the last of seven children. But there was only five left in the home because two had moved out when they were in their teens. They basically took off and went to the streets. So... um you know, that left five of us in the home, but there was still a lot of chi- a lot of kids around, and we all would be freaking out because my dad would be threatening to kill my mom, or my mom would be, you know, screaming and ranting and throwing dishes at my dad, <laughs> just any number of things, or my dad would be threatening to kill the family, which he was quite often doing, or threatening to kill somebody, you know, and my mom was also doing that, that was threatening to kill me mainly. Um, so yeah, I grew up believing there was something wrong with me. You know, absolutely, because I was human. I wasn't allowed to feel pain. I wasn't allowed to feel sorrow. Um, you know, if I cried, I'd, I'd, if, like I talked about that on quite a few of my shows, you know, any, if we cried, we were just beaten again. Like our parents would just beat us until we stopped crying. <laughs> They'd be like, stop crying right now. Or I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to keep beating you. And we, we would have to stop crying and pull it together. And then they'd stop. So you just learn right away. You don't cry. The beatings are a lot. A uh, shorter, you know, version, <laughs> less damage if you stop crying. Right? So you just take it, you know, and what then causes a lot of hatred in, in the heart because I couldn't release any emotion about it. So I just it it it, it, it just stayed in there and was became pent up rage. Right? So yeah, looking back on it, I mean, I did feel that there was definitely something wrong with me because, you know. I, you know, I wasn't really treated as a human being. And that's the problem with abuse. So this person says, I grew up believing that I had power over other people's feelings and they had power over mine. Now, that's not my situation because I didn't have any power over my parents' feelings whatsoever. <laughs> um, but my parents definitely had power over mine So and siblings as well. And they still do today. My siblings and I don't even talk. I cut them off because we still have no ability or capability to communicate in any kind of healthy way uh, because of the abuse. We get along for a few weeks, but that's about it. It's very much a superficial level because we can't ever talk about anything from our past, anything at all, because it causes way too many problems, brings up way too much hurt, too much pain, and nobody wants to deal with it. So I'm the only one that's on my healing journey that is going public. The rest of my siblings, there's only two alive right now that are left, but they're very, very silent. Probably mortified that I've actually done this and gone public with our story, but I'm sure they are. I don't talk to them anymore. But the thing is, is I don't care. You know, um, I didn't, you know, this was wrong what, what happened here and abuse is wrong and I don't mind speaking out about it. It doesn't, it, it makes me happy to do it because not that many people can do this. And so I've, you know, I don't mind doing it. But some of the stuff, like, I relate to, some of it I don't. But it is quite interesting. And just the fact that, um, you know, these boundary issues, um, for instance, what used to, what I've found in John Bradshaw's work mainly, and also Robert Burney's work, was the the, the topic and the issue of, um, of uh, what do you call that, copying or mimicking, mirroring, I suppose you want to say, mirroring my, my abuser's um, emotions. And that was so that I could prevent from being abused. I was always, it, I was always trying, uh, you know, nobody probably knew that I was doing this, but I was always trying to avoid a beating, right, because my mother was just always just shy of giving me a beating. She loved it. Any chance she got, she would be so happy. She, she could, like, throw me around the room and 
beat on me and throw me into walls and shove shove me into furniture and bash me and you know beat on me. She was just really highly uh, wanting to like hurt me. So I think she just got her jollies or something. I'm not sure what what it was all about, but all I know is a real drag. And so I used to try to stick up for her. I basically took her side on everything as much even though she was my main abuser, my dad was um, abusing her. So I always took her side because I did feel that she was the one that was the victim in that. And I did take her side because I felt that she was right in that. Um, It wasn't just to avoid abuse. But that's just one side of it. I also took her side on everything because I wanted to make sure that I was aligned with her emotionally. So if she was down, I was down. If she was sad, I was sad. I made sure, made a point to make her realize that because she was sad, I was sad. Or if she was hurting, I wanted for her to connect with her on that level so that she would see that I was agreeing with her and that would then um, hopefully buy me some brownie points <laughs> so that for, some, for for a future date when she was going to abuse me, right? But it didn't always work. It actually hard. I don't think it ever worked. Um, I used to think it worked, but but you know I'd find out a few weeks later that it didn't. So it's kind of it's kind of you know bizarre that behavior. Well, what that did to me by doing that is caused me then as an adult to mirror other people's emotions around me. So I do I do I catch myself doing it all the time. And it's not that I'm not empathetic and, you know, in, in my adult years and somebody comes to me and they're, you know, they're telling me something that's very, gone on with their life and they're very down and upset and, and you know, sad. Of course, that's going to, you know, I'm going to feel something about that. I'm going to, I'm going to care, you know, but I find that it's really just a, it's almost like a reaction. It's just a natural reaction. Um, I'm getting better as I get older to not take on to not mirror so much uh, so much of that stuff but i do tend to naturally automatically do it it's a little bit weird um I'm, i catch myself doing it and i i'm trying to actually break, break that because it's just a it's a habit formed from so long ago um that i don't have to do that you know i'm my own person and i have my own feelings my own set of feelings and i don't need to mirror other people other people's feelings she this person who wrote this article goes on to talk a little bit more about this um in the next part of the article. So we can, we'll, we'll pick that up on the the next show. But I just think it's interesting. This is, this stuff is so hard to see even in ourselves. And I had talked about it on the last show that I didn't even realize that I had so many boundary issues and problems like that until a life coach spotted it and actually brought it out to my, the forefront, you know, and actually told me about it. Otherwise I wouldn't have known, um, what I was doing was even a, an issue with codependency or, or, or boundary issues or anything like that. So that's when I, I started actually getting busy um, looking into these things and actually started to get help because I thought, man, I am really screwed up. <laughs> you know, not a bad way. I mean, as an adult, I'm doing really well. You know, I really am. And I mean, I have my better days and better moments. But, um, you know, I can hold a job. I can make things happen you know I, I'm not um, I'm a high functioning a, a survivor of abuse um, but the thing is is I mean I still have work to do and it's uh, you know I, I, I don't recognize a lot of this stuff in myself and I need um, you know like that's why I do a lot of studying and I do a lot of looking into this stuff so I can correct it you know because it's not necessary this stuff is what I use to cope and what we as children who were being abused used to cope a long time ago and also used to try to to help ourselves and you know to to survive basically survival skills um it's that's that's what they are so they work at that time to try to help us to survive what we're trying to survive which is the abuse which is a miracle anybody survives it right and so um as an adult they don't work anymore they're very dysfunctional so then we have to lose that stuff and it's hard because this stuff it was ingrained in childhood so we don't. I, I think that's the issue. We don't recognize it because it's it's something that's been in there for so long. You know, how would you even recognize that there's something wrong with that behavior? And so it's interesting. It really is. So hopefully you're getting something out of this. I know I do. So we'll pick up the next part of this article um, next week. I should be here next week. Um, I'm feeling a lot better and got over my cold and things are going pretty good. So I'll, we'll we'll pick up next week for sure. And here's some. Um, as far as positive reinforcement, you know, what am I doing right in my daily walk? Well, I'm starting a, um, 
I'm going to start doing for real some exercise program because I got to get in better shape. This winter is going to be a long winter here in Canada, and I can't sit around just you know lazing around. I, I seriously need to get in better shape uh, physically. So that's all part of this too, right? I don't care about my body because it, because I was abused in every way, you know, physically, sexually. Um, so to me, my body's ruined, and that's how I see it. You know, I don't see it as this this great thing that I've been given this gift. You know that I you know I should take care of. Um, I just see it as this thing that's just wasted and was you know so not taken care of, and it's something that I guess it probably has leftover shame probably from the CSA child sexual abuse. That probably has a lot to do with it that I haven't dealt with. And also just the, the physical abuse from my mother mainly, some from my dad, but I think the stuff from my mother was a lot more damaging. And um, so I have a hard time with my uh, myself, my body, right? And so I'm going to try to do better to take care of my body so that I can stick around for a few more years. <laughs> And actually do something with myself and, you know, live out the number of my days instead of just, you know, giving up early, right? I'm going to really work on it. This is something I'm working on uh, starting, actually. I, I just started sort of looking into it the last couple of weeks. So that's one positive. And I'm um, trying to eat better and, you know, trying to take care of myself better. And that's a big, big deal for survivors of abuse. It's very difficult um, for anybody, but especially for people that are coming from behind the eight ball. Here's some self-nurturing ideas from um, Havoka. These are from Havoka too. We're almost done looking at their stuff on their website, but I found it very helpful. As far as uh, as uh, self-nurturing ideas, physiological needs uh, for one, eat breakfast or you know eat healthy, right? Take a nap, uh, break a bad habit if just for today. That's what I'm working on, breaking some bad habits, and um, I'm. It's a slow process, but I'm going to get there. <laughs> get at least seven hours of sleep. That'll never happen for me. I don't sleep well at all. I mean, most abuse survivors I don't think do. And it's uh, it's difficult. I don't, in my body, I can't, I don't really do well sleeping that long. But I'll sleep as long as I can, you know, probably five to six hours. Um, drink eight glasses of water today. Some people say that's dangerous because you can overload your kidneys. I wouldn't even follow that. Just drink water, some water during the day. That's what I find that I try to do is make sure I have a glass of water or a couple glasses of water um, throughout the day. Even just one is better than none. Eat a healthy snack. I'm working on that because I'm going to work on trying to get in better shape. Um, those are some important things that we could do, you know, as far as uh, self-nurturing um, ideas. You can get these from Pavoka as well. It's part of their, uh, oh, it's, it's their self-esteem affirmations, but they had some... Uh, ideas, you know, for self-nurturing ideas there. So you can check that out there. So yeah, we only have a couple minutes left. So, I mean, this show goes really fast. But we'll have to... Yeah, we've only got about a minute left. We'll pick up on the next one. So all I want to say to you, you know, if you're a survivor and you're struggling and you're having a hard time and you don't have a clue how you're going to make it through the night, because I've been there, so many of us have, um, you know, you have to reach out. You have to reach out. You, No one's going to know you're in that position. you know. And even if they did, would they be able to help you? Maybe not. You need to reach out. You need to call a crisis line. If you, if you don't have somebody to talk to, which so many times we don't, most often we, we don't, then you need to call a crisis line. You need to get some help. There's people out there that care. There's people out there that have been abused that care. And they're sitting on those crisis lines and they want to help. And they want you to make it, right? You have to want to make it, you know, and that's where that's the decision I came down to 41 years old going on 42, um, you know, that I was going to live. I was not going to die. I was going to live. And that that gave me victory over my abusers. That's my victory. They couldn't kill me. And so they couldn't even get me to kill myself. Right. That's my victory. So I want that for you. And I want you to you stick it out get some help just talk to people you trust talk to some survivors because there are some trustworthy survivors especially over at nasca n-a-a-s-c-a.org nasca.org get a hold of somebody there there's all kinds of really awesome survivors there that's what we do right and get a hold of me i'm available like all over the place you can contact me right i want you to have a good night and uh or a good day wherever you are in the world there 
take good care of yourself. Until the next time, we'll talk to you next week.